Welcome to this session, uh, Lobbyists, the New Hidden Persuaders. I'd like to thank uh, Pagefield and PwC for helping to sponsor this event today. My name is Kirk Leach. I work for the ABPI, the British Pharmaceutical Industry, and I work helping the industry deal with questions around lobbying around animal research uh, in the UK. I will now run through the speakers very quickly and in the order they're going to speak. So first of all is Jamie Matthews on my far left. James is a management consultant and commentator on American current affairs based in New York. He's a fan and member of the New York Salon and has produced a number of events in, for the Salon, including one, the culture of corruption and athletes as role models. Second speaker will be Mary Mon Fries. Mary's from PwC, who has said it helped sponsor this event today. Mary is a partner within PwC and has been a member of the firm's UK tax leadership team for the last four years. She has responsibility for policy regulation and external relations across the tax business. Our third speaker is Simon Burrell. Simon is the director of Involve, has a long and extensive experience in areas of democratic reform, governance, participation, stakeholder engagement, and has worked um, at the national level in Africa, Asia, and Europe, as well as on related issues to global governments, governance and democracy. Our fourth speaker is Eliane Glazer. Eliane is a writer, radio producer, and honorary research fellow at Birkbeck University in London. Her latest book, Get Real, How to Tell It Like It Is in a World of Illusions, was published in March this year. And she also writes regularly for The Guardian, and her articles have appeared in The Times, Literary Supplement, and The London Review of Books. And finally, um, Oliver, on my right, who just made it fighting his way through the TUC demonstration. <laughs> A which well accounts the police for handing out leaflets saying how they supported the demonstration today, which indicates the strange world that we're living in. Oliver spent 12 years campaigning for commercial broadcasters, the film industry, and property and automotive services, both in the UK and in Brussels, and is head of Pagefield's media practice and leads on their accounts for a wide range of media sectors as well as non-media sector clients. He's also worked for uh, clients, worked for the Labour Party, and the Conservative Party, and also the National Lottery. Okay, so um, lobbying. Been a lot of it in the news this week. Thankfully, on cue, the British Army generals decided they were for sale to help us advertise uh, this session. Jamie. Hi, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Just what I'm gonna talk about, you know, as you know, we don't have all, all that much time, and so what I'm gonna do is just look at how bad is the problem uh, and what's the scale of the problem, and what are the implications for this whole debate around um, lobbyists and, and generally the role of money in, in, in politics? You know, in the U.S., there, it, this has been a hot, hot subject over the, especially over the past, let's say, seven to ten years. Um, and, and most high profile was the conviction of uh, lobbyist Jack Abramoff, um, 2005. One of President Obama's first acts in office was, was a law to um, uh, clamp down on the re so-called revolving door of, of um, uh, government officials going into private industry immediately after leaving office. And generally, lobbyists have a very, you know, the public have a very low opinion of, of lobbyists. Um, they're seen as hired guns, no principles. Um, there's huge money involved. It's hard to get a good estimate, but something like over $3 billion is one estimate I saw. And it certainly has grown in recent years, and some put it down to the Obama stimulus has, has led to a growth in lobbying. And generally, there's just a feeling there's too much money in politics, whether it's the spending on the ele election campaign or... And right now you've got... It's both left and right. You know, you see Occupy saying corporate get corporates out of politics, you see the Tea Party saying this crony capitalism, and, and you know, those are extremes maybe, but even in the middle, there's this just general view. But when you start to look at this, and I, you know, was uh, uh, over the past year or so, I've, I've read a fair amount around this, I find it hard to find that this is such a bad, you know, that the problem's all that, that bad. You know, if you look at, certainly historians will say in the U.S. it's not as anywhere near what it was before. I don't know if, if you guys get Boardwalk Empire here, but, you know, Nucky Thompson, right, the 1920s, 
uh, teapot dome scandal. I mean, that was real corruption. You know, the cases, there was a case a few years ago about this Democrat, William Jefferson. He's found with $90,000 of cash in his freezer. The thing is, those stories stand out precisely because they're so rare. The, the recent books on the subject all start out with, you know, it's, the, the world is, the U.S. is not as corrupt as it used to be. There's a rec even the people who are sort of saying this is a problem, it start out with that premise. But, and what you, t the argument tends to be around that, that the issue is much more subtle than that. That there's, um, it's not old fashioned bribery and backhanders, but it's, it's more potential conflicts of interests. It's, it's around the perceptions and, 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 and the trust that the public has as a result of those perceptions. So for instance, uh, prominent author Lawrence Lessig, a Harvard professor, he, he talks about what he calls the gift economy, or what you might colloquially call more back, back scratching. So he sort of says, you know, there's no explicit quid pro quo, but you know, if, if, if you have a donor over time giving a lot of money to a particular politician, eventually they call in that favor. That that's the kind of premise, is that it becomes, um, that, that becomes the issue. But, you know, then he goes on to sort of say, well, what, I mean, he's actually very fair-minded, and as he goes through it, and he says, so what evidence do I have of that? Well, my evidence is that it distorts the priorities. It's not so much you can say this politician was bought off, but just issues don't get discussed. So he says, you know, unemployment isn't thoroughly discussed. Uh, climate change isn't thoroughly discussed. But, but what that really sort of says is, you know, the issues that he thinks are the priorities are not being discussed. Why not? because there's money involved. But it seems pretty clear to me that you know, neither party really has a solution on employment, so there's not a lot of desire to, to raise the issue. Climate change, some want to raise it. In the recession, that has been seen as not a major priority. Um, there's a lot of valid, honest reasons why these issues wouldn't be raised. You don't have to tie it, everything's not tied back to the fact of monies involved in politics. And you know, some people, th it's a very common sense view. I mean, so much money is being spent. It must be distorting our politics. Well, you can find plenty of examples. Most recently is in uh, California, where um, the former CEO of eBay, Meg Whitman, outspent Jerry Brown 10 to 1 and lost by a huge margin. Um, and you know, and you find like, um, you know, right now there's kind of like an arms race. You see Romney and Obama both spending a lot of money. But you've got to sort of think, you know, how effective is this all? I mean, they're basically just kind of throwing mud at each other. Um, you know, if I was one of their backers, I'd want my money back because it seems like it's, it's not doing anything. And again, you know, and, and Lessig points it out in his book, there really isn't academic research or anything to back up this issue. So now you could say, okay, well, Maybe there's just some people out there, they're very vigilant, watchdogs. What's, what's the problem with that? You know, people are trying to find out, you know, if there's corruption going on and keeping, keeping politicians honest, that's fine. But I think there is a problem with this whole discussion um, that, that's bigger than that. The first thing is I think all these calls to clamp down on lobbying and spending, ultimately at the root, root of very unde undemocratic instincts, Sort of bottom line is that people and groups have the right to petition their government. In the U.S., it's actually enshrined in the First Amendment. And lobbying is, through test cases, been shown to be an issue of free speech. Uh, people and groups have interests, and they have the right to put forward those interests. And there's a basic concept of democracy is it's the clash, it's the fighting out of those interests. And though people, at the same time, have the right to hire specialists to represent them, uh, in this, you know, in other words, lobbyists. And they've existed since the beginning of the republic. Um, there's a perception that lobbyists work just for big business, but they're also, you know, lots of not-for-profit and advocacy groups. Um, and it's arguably not a bad thing that politicians are listening to different constituencies, including lobbyists. But the second problem I'd say about this whole discussion around lobbying is I really think it dis distorts our political discourse. I mean, the basic presumption is that basic individuals are corrupt. And I think that really feeds into a cynicism today. And it really distorts the kind of discussion we can have about issues, right? 
So take a, you know, a really obvious example the last few years. You know, say someone comes out and says, you know, I'm, I don't really agree with climate change. I don't think it's happening, or I don't agree with the consensus on this. Well, immediately the response is not, well, where's your science, or you know, here's my argument. It's, it's you know, who, who's funding you, right? Well, who's behind you? Well, who do you represent? And so instead of getting to the argument, we're talking about what's behind it. Now, you know, statistics show that, polls show that trust in politicians and government is an all-time low. And campaigners tend to say that's precisely because of the corruption that exists, and it's a justifiable thing. But, um, but really, that, that mistrust is a broader problem and, and basically a, a kind of drift in politics. And the, the basic irony is that these attempts to, say, for transparency in these issues really backfire because it really institutionalized mistrust. Um, they're really basically making that a, um, assumption. And uh, it basically says the, the issue that you can't really trust what goes on in private. What I would argue is we have enough evidence what's available, and we ought to care not so much about individual politicians, what they do behind closed doors, but really collective institutions and what they do in the open. Um, well, look, when I started first thinking about uh, this session, which I think is a fascinating uh, subject, I thought, let's go back to basics. I went on Wikipedia and uh, looked up, well, what is the definition per Wikipedia of lobbying? And it told me this, the act of attempting to influence decisions made by officials in the government, most often legislators or members of regulatory agencies. And that got me to thinking to government, it got me thinking to what really, I'm really proud of in this country, what I really feel passionate about, which is democracy. So I went and looked up democracy on Wikipedia too. And that will tell you that democracy is an egalitarian form of government in which all the citizens of a nation together determine public policy, the laws and actions of their state, requiring that all citizens have an equal opportunity to express their opinion. It then goes on to say that in practice, democracy is the extent to which a given system approximates this ideal. And the elements that are essential is that citizens are adequately informed and able to vote according to their own best interests as they see them. Also absolutely essential in my view is that policy makers are adequately informed. Informed about the impact of their policy on various groups of people within society. And so if you follow my train of thought on that, it won't surprise you to hear that I passionately believe that lobbying with the right intent and the right way of doing it is absolutely critical part of democracy. I would argue that channels to facilitate a voice for different parts of society and a way to enable people making decisions to make sure they can fill in their own experience gaps is absolutely vital. And indeed, you hear people saying this. Martin Donnelly from Biz, he quoted publicly once that one of his department's biggest strengths is their linkages to what he called the outside world the part of the world the government departments perhaps otherwise don't see. But hey, what are the challenges to that? And I think the first challenge is the one we hear a lot, that big, powerful organisations are in a position to exert too much influence. And actually, I hear what James says, that you know, uh, lobbyists don't just work for big business, particularly in the States, they work for um, charities, not-for-profit organisations. And I think that's really important. That drives me to one of my points which is, I think, it doesn't actually matter how many people there are who are influencing uh, government decisions and doing that. It's how they do it, and importantly, what the breadth is. What the breadth is of, how, of who is being listened to. So if I'm making a policy decision, am I making sure that I am listening to people who have a breadth of experience so that I fill in those gaps? Also, it's about the way you do it. I, mean, I honestly think it would be pretty foolhardy for any organization to think just because it's big, people are going to do what you want. I think that's pretty foolhardy. Having said, though, I think to ignore or pretend that there isn't something there about potentially being in a position of either actual or perceived influence is probably about as dangerous as pretending there isn't anything called personal bias when you make uh, recruitment or um, uh, promotion decisions. I think we have to recognize it's there, real or perceived. So what does that do? In my mind, that puts an absolute responsibility 
on the organisation, whether it's officially a lobbyist or whether you are in a position of some influence when you're having these conversations, to do through two things. And one is to be absolutely open and honest about your motive, and as importantly, to be absolutely open and honest about your field of experience. Where is it that I'm qualified to help you with your questions about how this policy impact will land? Let's not pretend that we know what we don't know. We like to think we're objective, but actually all of us are conditioned by the experiences we have in life. We may change careers, we may have a varied experience, but we're all conditioned by that experience. So the important thing is to make sure that the person listening to you understands what is that experience, which gap are you filling for them. The other thing I'd say that this tone and commentary a lot of the time around big business versus society suggests something that is binary. It's either for the benefit of business or it's for the benefit of society. I guess I strongly believe that that's a fallacy. Economic growth, in my view, with the jobs it brings, the taxes that flow, is, is absolutely crucial for everyone in this country, not just the wealthy. And the other thing I'd say is remember that companies don't vote. Individuals do. And to think that uh, politicians don't care about the individuals who are going to vote, again, I think would be, would be pretty foolhardy. And we as individuals should not allow ourselves to disempower ourselves by thinking that we don't have a voice. So I think I close by saying, again, there has to be openness about the motivation, there has to be openness and honesty about the area of expertise. And there has to be a responsibility on both parties, the person influencing and the person being influenced, to understand and be open about why they're there, what's their experience, and who else do they then need to talk to? Thank you very much. Kirk, this is a fantastic room. We've got birds, we've got water, we've got trees. How much did you pay to get this room? A lot of money. <laughs> I thought so. So um, this debate is being framed in a, as a simple black and white choice between transparency or not. On the one side, we're being told we need voices to strengthen democracy and that transpar transparency will push those voices away so democracy will be weakened. On the other side, we're being told that lack of transparency weakens democracy. And I'm going to be making the case that this is, a, is, this is a magician's trick. Actually, we're being pointed towards lobbying and transparency, and that's not the issue at all. The issue is somewhere else completely. And I'll tell you, tell you what I think it is in a minute, but I'd just like to keep you on tender hooks just for a second. Because, of course, transparency, um, lobbying must be transparent. And corruption isn't actually the issue. The issue is, is, is bigger than corruption in many ways. And I guess, James, my question to you would be, um, if your case is so strong, if the case of people making, doing the lobbying is so strong, why not make it public? I think that I don't understand why it should be made public. So when the government believes that, trans that lobbying should be made transparent, it's uh, issued a consultation document recently around the registr registry of lob lobbyists, and it says... A statutory register of lobbyists is an important step towards making politics more transparent. We are determined, say this government, to keep working to open up politics and make it more, acceptable to, more accessible to everybody. So the government believes it. So um, the, the, it feels to me like the case is closed. This isn't really about um, transparency at all. And of course, it must apply to all, and there's a danger at the moment that the current register is going to apply to um, third-party lobbyists who are employed by corporations and charities, to charities and nobody else. But actually, of course, it must apply to corporations and in-house lobbying units as well. If it doesn't, then everything will get pushed back into those um, corporate, corporate lobbying as opposed to third parties and charities. And we, do, we know that lack of transparency does reduce trust, and I would point you towards the issue of energy in this country at the moment. There is immense scepticism both about wind power and about nuclear power because nobody really knows who's benefiting. And what we, so what we have is absolutely no debate at the national level about how we power this country. And some reports are saying we're going to run out of energy in three years' time. L lack of transparency in lobbying has huge implications for this country and for, for other countries too. And if people don't trust where, why a decision has been made, they're more likely to be resistant to those decisions, so we're less likely to get wind farms, for example, which costs money, costs taxpayers money. So lack of transparency is a significant issue. But of course, on the other side, of course, more voices strengthen democracy. And the government again recognises this, um, but I think in the interest of time I'll just um, move on a little bit. And my organisation's got lots of evidence that increasing voices make, makes for better, more effective decisions, it leads to more accountability, and indeed it reduces corruption. 
So the question isn't about transparency of lobbying, because lobbying, of course, must be transparent. We must have specific, the transparency must be specific. We must know who, when, and about what, all the things that Mary was talking about, and it must apply to everybody, not just corporates, but also charities. The question, actually, is how do we bring more voices into the debate? How do we bring small charities and non-governmental organisations into the debate who don't have the money to enter the debate at the moment? Whether they be school governors, whether they be a local women's institute, whether they be a whole... They, voices that are not heard in the debate at the moment. And it's not just about um, community groups, it's also about small and medium-sized enterprises, whether it be the local uh, car repair workshop. How do, they, how do we get these voices into the debate? Because they're missing at the moment. And, of course, citizens. Where's the, where's the, how do we get citizens into the debate as well? Because we are affected by the decisions that government take, and, and all too often we're cut out of it. And we know that engagement works. Engaging, bringing more voices into the, into the debate works. Because it can change perceptions about what the problem is. It can change perceptions about each other. If lobbying is kept transparent, then actually we don't learn from each other. Unless we get everything out on the table, we can't actually really learn what the problem is. So let's make it all transparent so we can have all those views and actually learn from each other. We know, and we've got lots of examples, how bringing more voices, both the public and other voices, into the room can lead to different outcomes, lots more creativity, much better decisions. It can help to ensure that solutions are accepted, that the risks of resistance are much lower, because people have been involved in the decision, they understand why it's been taken, and they've got an investment in it. And actually, if you involve people in making a decision, they're much more likely to implement the decision. So, the government is opening a number of doors to both increasing transparency and increasing the number of voices in the debate. Um, and the, the, question, the question, therefore, is obviously we need to make lobbying more transparent. And how do we bring those voices into the debate so that we can make, uh, make policy making, uh, democracy, and our society richer for the many and not just for the few? Thank you. So I'm very interested in the broader context for this debate. Because what, we can talk about transparency, we can talk about publishing reams of government data, business plans and so on, and publishing registers of lobbying interests, dumping huge amounts of data on the internet and, and so forth. But what I'm really interested in is what people know, what the public knows, and what the public, how much power the public actually has. You know, um, in a very sort of on the ground, everyday way. And I think that the public is influenced by rhetoric and I think that there's a, a huge amount of rhetoric at the moment in our politics and in our culture about people power. You know, we hear this in corporate slogans, you know, Vodafone slogan, power to you, Yahoo slogan, the internet's under new management, yours, Time magazine awarding its person of the year in 2006 to you. Um, you know, we hear a lot about citizen um, activism, you know, the citizen journalism, the power of bloggers. I've got a Google search set up for people power and I get sort of 10 results a day from, from various media outlets. People power, citizen power um, is, is everywhere. Also, rhetoric of transparency. When the Cameron's um, transparency drive last year, I'd like to quote, he said, you know, uh, when he was talking about publishing government business plans, um, this is a complete revolution in transparency. It's going to have a profound impact. Information is power. It lets, lets people hold the powerful to account and so on. I'm very interested in this rhetoric of transparency, this rhetoric of people power, um, and also the rhetoric of consumer savviness, you know, that in this age of great sophistication in adverts and, and marketing, it's okay because consumers are incredibly savvy, they can see through this kind of um, marketing um, and so on. So I think this is the context in which this discussion about lobbying is taking place, because that kind of rhetoric really influences everyday people about what they know and about the power that they have. And I think this rhetoric contrasts with the reality of lobbying, you know, the, the, the business interests from um, health um, to aviation to construction to media to banking. You know, these business interest, interests are real. You know, we can all talk about the breadth of voices, the breadth of input, diversity of voices, and, you know, the fact that charities employ lobbyists and so on. That's all great. But the, the one word that's missing from this discussion is power. And, and, and I think we need to talk more about that. So I think that you, you have a rhetoric of people power and transparency which um, contrasts with the reality of the lobbying industry, um, the revolving door and, and so on that, that we can discuss in more detail. And, and that what's happened 
with the collision between the rhetoric and the reality is that the political and the corporate world has adapted to that, con that contrast between rhetoric and reality to produce more rhetoric of authenticity. Right, see, we saw this in the, in, the, um, in the party conferences. There was a lot of talk of this is who I am, you know, Miliband. Um, this is my educational background. Um, this is where I come from. You know, it's very down to earth, sort of the language of authenticity. And this language of authenticity is rife in the commercial and the corporate world. In marketing, if you read books about marketing now, it's all about, it's all about engagement with consumers um, about um, authenticity, and I really think that we, sh we need to, to, to track that word, authenticity, and see how it's being used against us um, and to obscure the reality of lobbying. Cameron, again, I love quoting him. He talked about, in 2000, uh, last year, the far too co uh, cosy relationship between politics, government, business and money, that he wanted to um, clean up lobbying, this, this thing that has tainted our politics for too long. We need to come clean about who is bu buying power and influence. You know, Cameron, no, no uh, stranger to, to lobbying himself. And I think it's fascinating that he does deploy this language in his speeches all the time. And these speeches are what people hear in the media and it influences their perception of what is going on. And I think we need to, to, to look at the effect that those kinds of speeches have and how they contrast with the reality. My final point is about ideology, which is um, a dirty word in our political um, uh, discourse these days. Um, when, people talk about, when politicians say the word ideology, it's to criticize the opposition. They are motivated by ideology. We are simply doing what works. We're just trying to get the job done. This is a political era of um, bipartisan cooperation in the states. Um, we're seeing that with Obama's administration of um, coalition working together in the, in the uh, public interest and national interest and so on. Ideology is dead at the moment in, pub in political debate. And I think that's really dangerous because, um, because there is ideology in political debate. It's just not being expressed um, explicitly. Um, in 1990, with the fall of the Berlin Wall, Francis Fukuyama said, you know, this is the end of history. The ideological battlegrounds that characterize the 20th century are a thing of the past. Western capitalism has now triumphed. You know, this is the end of the big debates. Well, I think that's wrong, because I think there is still right and left in politics. But I think that, that what's happened to vested interests and lobbying is, is, is um, included uh, among those, is that those vested interests are now operating under the surface. So politicians do have ideological intent, it's just that they're not actually telling voters what that intent is. Lobbyists are influencing politicians, but we don't know in what ways. So I would like to bring back ideological struggle, ideological debate, because that is a key part of democracy. And, you know, we'll talk more about democracy, but last I heard, democracy was about voting. It was about one person, one vote. So, again, um, this would come, brings us back to the issue of power. Um, I don't think that lobbying is part of the democratic process insofar as, as democracy is about voting um, rather than influencing politicians in the lobby, which is, um, has obviously very shady connotations. So I'll just leave it there. That final point was where I'm about to start. I was going to take people on a very brief history lesson. Lobbying is nothing new. Um, it's been practiced since Parliament was first established. Um, for those of you who don't know, and I think we're about to get that, that point, the central lobby in Parliament um, was named like that because that's where people went to meet with their MP and to lobby them. Um, and those are on issues to do with their local community and businesses that were back then uh, needing to influence. This practice continues to this day, whether you are a uh, an individual or whether you are a lobbyist like me or whether you are a corporate or a charity. So if we accept that in some form we're all lobbyists, um, then this practice of discussing issues with politicians and putting across firmly held points of view, and yes, persuading them, is nothing new. In fact, it sits right at the heart of a healthy democracy. We in the UK have a long and proud history of standing up for freedom of speech, both here in the UK and across the globe, it's a fundamental part of our DNA um, that we believe that everyone, regardless of who they are, who they represent, their views, should have the right to bring issues that concern them to the attention of politi politicians and policymakers who surround the politicians. The reason we're all here today is, is not because of individual constituents lobbying their MPs, because there's been a surge in that, quite the opposite in fact, but because something of a frenzy has been sparked around 
people like me uh, and other people who are um, representing organizations and indeed the likes of, of um, the generals at the weekend. Now what this generally is for people like me is, a, is an industry that's yes known as lobbying, it's a bit of an American term and it's not a familiar term in the UK apart from those of us in this sort of the, the bubble that's interested. It's also known as public affairs. Um, and that is about a better understanding of issues and organizations um, and making sure that you're informing uh, policy makers and decision makers. There was a point that was made earlier about the influence that lobbyists have on the democratic process. And I think it's just important at, at, at that point just to consider that in this country, I think a lot of people in this room won't have been alive for a referendum in this country. And there is, there is a debate to be had about the appetite that there is out there for individuals wanting to get involved in what they perceive as government being elected to do on their behalf. This issue doesn't just cover Westminster. Um, we're talking here about parish level, local level, national level, international level, the EU, right up to the UN. Lobbying goes on across the globe at all sorts of different levels. And I return to the point I made earlier about the individual's right to be heard. Why should it be any different for companies for charities, for pressure groups, for trade unions today on the, on the march through London, absolutely is, is the right thing to be doing. It's part of a democracy. What about last year's proposals on forests? Very controversial. Without lobbying from experts in the environmental space, and Simon, apologies, might have been one of those from WWF. Um, without the lobbying from those sorts of organisations, we'd be on the verge now of mismanaging our very precious ancient woodlands, and the government did a, a, a U-turn quite rightly on that. On the charity tax earlier this year, which um, George Osborne has, has now, again, done a bit of a vault fast on, without the full force of charities lobbying government, we'd be in a pretty um, drastic situation now. So an important reason for my profession existing is that the political world operates in a very different way to you and I. They speak a very, very different language. You don't need to be a genius to see that when some of them are caught out in difficult situations, when, whether it be Andrew Mitchell in the last few weeks or, or, or other examples. So if you want to get your point across to them, you need to learn about how to use their language and how to speak in their, in their little bubble. And the reason my profession is always in demand is, 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 is not because necessarily reviewed by clients or boards of individual companies as being the only guarantee of getting government to decide in their favor, quite the opposite, but because we live and breathe politics. We are political geeks, we're political anoraks, um, and it's a very complicated system of parliamentary democracy that we live in, whereas they simply do not, uh, and quite often don't even understand the basics of how government works. We are there to help guide them through that process and to advise them on how to make their best case. Um, I've been involved in lobbies that I have lost. I've been in lobbies that I have won. I've seen uh, very big corporates, both national and international, losing lobbies. Um, I've been involved in those where they have won the lobby or perceived to won the lobby. So finally, I'll, I'll, I'll round up there. Without lobbyists, I'm in no doubt at all that a lot of very bad policies and very bad regulation would slip through the net. In very simple terms, we, lobbyists, help stop government from doing stupid things, and just as importantly, we help make good things happen. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to just pick a couple of questions to start the debate, and then I'll put it out to the floor. Jamie, to kind of paraphrase your talk, you basically argued that lobbying wasn't new, it was no big deal, it's actually democratic, and the discussion around lobbying uh, distorts public discourse. If you look at the, the public discussion about lobbying, it's completely the opposite, the last point, which is that many people would argue that lobbying actually distorts public discourse by the things that Oliver talked about, by um, lobbyists and consultants having too much influence over elected politicians. And Oliver actually said, you know, we as lobbyists have made politicians do this or do that. Could you answer that question? I mean, do you not think that maybe what you're kind of like slightly gilding the lily on, on lobbying? If, if it's existed for a long time, and if the sort of things that we do hear about are not um, something, you know, unprecedented, why are we talking about it so much more now? in our politics. Um, is it because we've just become enlightened people who, who now care or are more intolerant of this? Or does it say something about the way we think of people um, and, and, and the way we, instead of looking at, say, institutions and social factors, we tend to reduce 
those social interactions to kind of base motives of individuals and how they interact with each other. In particular, it's most likely how they interact with each other behind closed doors. These issues are, are much bigger than, than lobbying, what you're seeing, right? Um, I, I used to live in the, in the UK 14 years ago, moved back home to the US. I remember Jimmy Savile, right, on TV, right? And I come over here now and it's like, the whole country is obsessed with Jimmy Savile and it's like the whole BBC is being torn upside down and everything because of this one guy. I mean, and you know, you sort of think uh, there is generally this, this obsession that's about who can you trust? And you know, you think you know somebody, but really you don't. And, and, so there, and so this is just kind of the playing out of this general mistrust of people in the sphere of, of lobbying and the relationship between politics and, and, and business. And so to the, to the point before though, I mean, I think what you have to do is you hold politicians accountable for what they ultimately decide and do and how they go about the process of reaching that decision should be open and, and should also include uh, the right for them to speak in private and to make, you know, people all the time come out with crazy ideas, you know, uh, you know, that they, they, you know, and they have to be able to discuss these things because they just get driven underground otherwise. I, I just wanted to kind of pick up on, on, that, on one of those points and then just make a broader point. Just because there are other contributory factors to a lack of trust doesn't mean that we shouldn't try and stop one of the factors for a lack of trust. And I think Eliane pointed to the, this is actually, what we're really talking about here is power. Um, so I'm chair of an organisation called Democratic Audit, which um, looked at the data, or has kind of rehashed the data on its website, of um, uh, who met government between May 2010 and March 2011. So representatives of corporate interests met just over 1,500 times. Trade, trade groups, think tanks, and other interests met for just over 1,400 times. And then charities was a quarter of that at 800. And then trade unions were way below at 130 meetings. And this is just the meetings that have been made public, not the private meetings. So if we're looking at who's meeting government and which voices are being heard, then actually it's where the power is and the money is. And so, yes, of course, big business and, uh, and money should, should have a, has it, the right to engage with government. But that's not the point. The point is, what about the people who don't have the power and don't have the money? And actually, neither James nor Oliver has ad have addressed the central question of this debate, which is what's wrong with transparency and lobbying? They've said our voices need to be heard, but actually, why shouldn't that be public? And, and I haven't heard a single strong argument for that. Um, you know, it's not something I've, I've raised in my seat, but I haven't disagreed with you yet. So um, one, of, one of the points I would add is that one of the biggest lobbyists that exists in, in our democracy, and I, su I suspect in others around the globe, is the press. Um, whether that is direct or indirect, you know, every single day the, the, the press uh, still manages to dominate the, the water cooler talk and, 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 and what is discussed in uh, high levels of, of Westminster, whether it be a, a front page of the Telegraph or a front page on the Sunday Times. So, you know, there is, there is, that, that is very open and transparent, that sort of lobbying as well. Um, I think you, you are, your point about, um, you know, going down the, the sort of, to, to, to the lower tiers of, of individuals who, who want to raise their point, you, you're absolutely right. You know, um, in, in many ways, money does talk. But I think the point that you make about corporates meeting with government and charitable bodies meeting with government at similar, similar, similar levels, um, those corporates are well known for having a lot, lot, lot more money than those charities. So I'm not sure that, 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 that money is necessarily the best way of looking at it. It's more about people understanding how the system works. Well, I just say actually, I mean, the point Simon you raise about um, bringing more voices in, I think this, that's the heart of this actually. You know, I talked about how important it is to be open about what is your field experience, which gap are you filling. Um, I do think there's something about, whether we're talking about politicians or any other um, policy and decision maker, there is something about an onus of responsibility, which I think would be a good thing, to make sure when you're thinking of a policy or about to make a decision, who does it impact? And I have a responsibility to make sure I am talking to the breadth of voices. So I think you've stimulated some thought in me there, which is, I don't think it is good enough to just put something out for public consultation and see who comes back. I think there's an absolute responsibility to say, okay, who are the voices I'm hearing? Who am I not hearing? Who could this impact? And how do I make sure I hear that voice? And I think that would be a perfectly reasonable thing uh, to ask policymakers to do. Firstly, on the point of 
whether this is a new thing, you know, lobbying has been going on for centuries, etc. I mean, clearly, the, the, there are new developments. I mean, the lobbying industry has grown massively since the mid-90s. The influence of big business and corporate interests in politics has grown exponentially. Um, so, you know, I don't, I don't really recognise the world that we're living in from some of these comments. So the idea that, you know, that lobbyists make good things happen. We only need to look at the NHS reforms, the influence of private um, health uh, lobbies on that, um, the influence of construction um, industry on, on planning um, reforms or um, the, the dismantling of, of planning legislation in this country, the lack of banking regulation, even after everything that's happened the last few years. So, you know, I mean... Uh, corporate interests dominate politics. I mean, they're in a, in a, in a, in a, on a different level from, from the people. You know, we, there's a lot of talk of dem democracy, but you know, to my mind, we're living in a post-democratic moment here. The de democracy is giving way to a kind of a corporate state, in effect. But at the same time, the other new development that I'm seeing is, as, as I um, mentioned earlier, this um, in exponential growth in uh, the kind of language of engagement and transparency that we see wielded by the very elites, political and corporate, that are causing the, the problems. Um, and I think that the collision of these two things, that the, the, the reality of where power lies, but the, the kind of language of transparency and openness is, 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 a, is creating a, a serious problem. So uh, in the interest of transparency, uh, I should declare um, uh, myself, I think, to start off with, um, uh, I uh, help run a recruitment firm, a headhunting firm, that has probably been responsible for hiring more lobbyists in the UK and Brussels and across Europe than any other firm, uh, and then I personally have hired um, hundreds of lobbyists for global corporates and uh, tiny, small charities. That's an important thing to be transparent about. I've also written my notes on my daughter's um, uh, colouring book, uh, because I forgot to bring any paper, and I'm desperate to go to the loo. Uh, three important pieces of information. Uh, you decide uh, which is the most important one of those, and who should decide whether it's um, my background, uh, uh, where I've written my notes, or, or that I want to go to the loo, is the, the important thing. And this will cut to the point I want to make, and I'm sorry if you bear with me, uh, I do want to make a point and then answer a question. Because there was an enormous elephant in the room, I think Ellie and Simon, um, uh, you've, um, uh, it's been raised, but not addressed yet, and what a brilliant place to address it, and I'll come on to it with my question. The first one, because there's some pretty simple things here. Lobbying's lobbying, right? It's not a problem. Corruption is, okay? Corruption's a problem. It's against the law. If you get caught for doing it, you go to, you go to jail, okay? Uh, and it's the judiciary's and the police force's responsibility for tracking down corruption, and then there's due process that's responsible for sorting that out. Um, lobbying is the pursuing of your own self-interests, yeah, what's wrong with that? that that's good. People have self-interests. We live in a real world, and lobbying is a way of, of, of doing that. It, it's, a, it's as simple as that. The new, and people are, have implied that there is an, an old thing, lobbying is about the lobby in, uh, in Parliament. It's a very old um, uh, industry. Kind of misses the point. There is something new going on, uh, and the new is not about lobbying, but the circumstances within which the lobbying industry has grown and is currently working. And it's um, lobbying uh, simply re uh, reflects the professionalisation of politics. As ideology and the masses have left the political debate, um, it's become professionalised. And most of the lobbying industry are simp simply technical professionals who understand how politics works, who understand how regulation works, who are articulate, etc., etc. So that's all it is. It's a symptom of what's going on in our society rather than a problem in and of itself. Now, the elephant in the room. Uh, because, um, and I want to be uh, quite aggressive about this if I can, Ellie and Simon, would the panel agree, is there something sinister, even terrible, about your good intentions? Is the debate about transparency that appears to be a complete no-brainer actually an attempt to regulate debate? We're in debating, uh, we're in the battle for ideas. If you have uh, more transparency than you currently have, you will have to have a regulation of transparency. Regulation of transparency is the state entering further into our ability to discuss what's right. Whether that's the food colouring in a suite, or the tarmac on the road, or climate change. So what you, the people who are pursuing transparency appear positive is actually a very sinister thing. Does the panel agree?
Hello, Mark Adams from an organisation called Stand Up for Lobbying. It sounds like we're packing the room out with lobbyists, but so I've, I've, I've obviously got a vested interest as well. I'm going to make two very polemical points because this is supposed to be a bad... Well, I'll make them two very quickly. They are interlinked. One is there is no such thing as a lobbying scandal. Build, builds on what Ben said. And secondly, the case for transparency is actually extremely weak. You, invite, you said you've never heard the case against transparency. I would put it the other way around. Why are there no such things as lobbying scandals? Because they're actually political scandals, and politicians like to deny them as, lob, as, as their scandals. If it's true that the generals for hire in the Sunday Times last weekend really can get that level of influence in the Ministry of Defence, that's a bloody disgrace that the Ministry of Defence operates like that. That's a political scandal. It's not a lobbying scandal. It's misnamed, and politicians do that conveniently. As for the case for transparency, actually there is no general right to transparency. We all of us have a right to privacy. It's set down in Article 8 of the European Convention on Human Rights, incorporated into domestic law. And if we're going to have to give up our right to privacy, it's actually the other way around, Simon. You've got to tell me why I should be required to give up my right to privacy. It's not for, my, it's not for me to, ju to justify why, as a lobbyist, I, 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 I don't want to be transparent. And it's not lobbying that has to be transparent, it's politics. I fundamentally agree that it's politics that it should be transparent. What I do as a private individual, no one, I'm sorry, no one, Simon, has a right to know what I do as a private individual. I am not an elected politician. It's elected politicians that have to be transparent, not us lobbyists. Hello, hi, Amali. Um, going to the point about the lobbying registry, we're talking here, I guess, about undue or unfair influence um, and how that leads to, I guess, a, an inequality of voice and then subsequently an inequality of power. I'm just wondering how a lobbying registry is going to change this. It's, it doesn't change corruption. Um, it doesn't change um, someone sort of going out for dinner with someone they went to uni with and having a quiet conversation. It doesn't stop the political corruption or people sort of saying, oh, yes, no, I agree with that because you're going to give me some money or something like that. I don't think a lobbying register is the answer. And I think going to Mary's point, I think that it needs a change in the way that our decision makers engage with the process as opposed to the process being regulated because it's kind of trying to then fix the, 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 the symptom rather than the cause. Chris Noden, Institute of Economic Affairs. Someone's mentioned you know, corporate interest uh, dominating politics. I mean, that may be true to some extent. I actually think that pound for pound, the most effective lobbyists are the lobbyists for the NGOs and, and various charities. And a lot of these NGOs are themselves very largely funded by the government. I think one of the reasons that you don't have groups like the WI, for example, <clears throat> making a big impact on the policy debate is that because they're being pushed out by NGOs and uh, charities, groups that appear to be part of civil society, we're actually picked as winners, effectively, by the government. So the government is listening to voices it wants to hear. And the, a classic example of this is um, the Green Ten, some of the biggest green NGOs in Europe, overwhelmingly funded by the EU, and the EU is quite open about it. The EU's defence is that they get lobbied by big oil and so on, so they need to balance this out by effectively funding voices that they want to hear. Now, to me, that sounds like a, a subversion of democracy. These groups are more effective as lobbyists, largely because they appear to be part of civil society. In actual fact, they're, they're effectively extensions of the government. And it's pushing out the real civil society. You know, that's the problem. In, in one corner, you've got business. In the other corner, you've got these groups who are basically working for the government. And normal people uh, are excluded. I guess it's about trust, isn't it? Uh, and trust for me, trust isn't about knowing everything. If you know everything, then there's nothing left to trust. Trust is about trusting how people will make decisions. Um, I'm not a believer, actually, to pick up Amali's point, that a register or a tick box exercise on regulation is going to change behaviour at all. I think a, a register of lobbyists just saying who they are is not going to help anything. I think, going back to the earlier point, there is something about um, putting accountability on policymakers to say, when I've made this decision, am I open about who it impacts and who I've spoken to, whether through public consultation or another way? Yes, I am in favour of regulation. Um, you know, I just I think that uh, what's happened is the power now exists above the politicians with the corporate and financial interests. The politicians serve those interests, so I want the, the government to get back on top, as it were, to regulate um, this kind of behaviour. I, I agree with you that the lobbying industry is a symptom um, of a broader problem, that our political culture is essentially sick um, and that we need to remedy, remedy that through some um, through regulation and um, 
uh, but also through exposure of these kinds of practices. So, you know, while I'm in favour of, of trans transparency, as I said earlier, that's not enough just dumping loads of data on, on the public. You also need organisations in journalism to sift through that data and highlight um, that what's really going on. Um, in, a, in a way that, um, that, that makes sense to people. You know, we've heard a lot about privacy and freedom of speech, you know, that the, the lobbyists are entitled to this and that um, protection and so on. You know, I mean, it's, it just seems to me such a sort of topsy-turvy situation when the people who speak for powerful interests um, are, de are, are, are pleading for um, more sort of privacy, you know, human rights and so forth. You know, the, you know what the issue here is the public interest. Okay, and, and, the, and the vast majority of the, the money that is being spent is, is, to sh is, is, to, is in the service of bottom lines. It's not in the service of the public interest. So, you know, as so I want to refocus um, our attention on, on that. I, I actually now, uh, in a consultancy, in a, in a PR firm, I have less contact now with politicians than I did when I was in-house. One of, the, one of the things that we do, and lots of other uh, lobbying firms do, is advise our clients on how best to manoeuvre their way through the political system. Not in a, not in a dark and dingy way, but in simply because there are so many different elements to the democratic process. Second point on the register is, I'm personally relaxed either way, to be honest. I, I agree. I don't see that it's going to bring much benefit, because all it's, all it's simply going to do is just name who you are, what you're doing, your clients you have. It doesn't actually say the depth at which you're going into to, to help those clients. But if there is going to be a register, it has, to co it has to cover everybody who is involved in this industry. And then the third point is, as an aside to that, the more, which I think is to Ben's point, the more you basically regulate the industry, the more you will have instances like Michael Gove using his private means in order to communicate, which takes it completely underground. And there's then no accountability whatsoever. There are lots of magician sleights of hand going on here. So, uh, so Mark, uh, Ben, sorry, um, you, were, you were comparing corruption to lobbying, but those are two very different things. Of course corruption is bad. That doesn't make lobbying good by and of itself. Because actually, I've already said that lobbying is a good thing. We need to get voices in the debate. The question is how you get more, vo more voices in the debate. And, ben, and Mark, um, nobody's asking you to give up your privacy. What we're asking for is when you act in the public realm to influence in relation to the pu public interest, not as a private citizen, but somebody's being paid for it, there seems to be some, they, I, it seems to me the argument is quite strong for making that, that contact public. Why? <laughs> but particularly when you've only got a small number of voices um, in the debate. So, um, and, and my final point is, is coming, coming to your point about the, the role of the registry. Um, and of course, though, the registry won't, won't change an awful lot, I don't think. And the question really is, at the moment, the public and those voices that aren't heard in the debate are brought in right at the end of the policy process. They're brought in once the policy's been decided and they're consulted on in a very tick box way. The real question is how do we change government from being inward focusing, focusing on where the money is and, where, when, and, and who's coming to lobby them, and bringing, taking them outwards so that government actually engages citizens and community groups and, and others at a much earlier stage in the process so that we're all involved um, in, in formulating some massive policies that affect us. Haven't got to the sock puppet um, uh, uh, question there, but maybe we'll get a chance to come back to that because it's a, an interesting one. Yeah, I said earlier that I thought that there was a general issue of mistrust in society which expresses itself in this area as well as el elsewhere. The issue of transparency is also one that comes up in all different areas. The word is only in the 1990s that it really come up in the way that it's being used right now. And it's presented as a virtuous thing, not, not just neutral. And, and there, is, there are problems with it. I mean, give two examples, very different. You know, the, the biggest anti-corruption organization is Transparency International, they call themselves. And what you find is that they're primarily focused on corruption in the third world. And it's really a cover for Western organizations to have the right to go in and dictate to these countries how they should operate because they're not being open enough. And take another example, in the States, you've got uh, sex offenders, so-called Megan's Law, right? Same, same concept. What have you got to hide? Why not reveal that they're sex offenders in the neighborhood? Well, what you've found, of course, is since you do that, is there's been a tremendous amount of harassment of, sex, of prior sex offenders who've done their time. In fact, there's been people who've been, you know, they've been killed as a result of this. There are consequences for this. Um, it's, not, it's not neutral. And you know, it's, it's really an endless process because as soon as you sort of say transparency, well, you know, there's a certain amount, there's certain rules come in, but then people say, but yeah, 
what are you really doing? Did you meet out, did you not, did you go to a meeting where you didn't provide minutes? How do we know what you're really doing? It's like an endless process. And finally, I think it just, as I said, distorts the discussion. Earlier, someone mentioned uh, nuclear power, right? So in the past, you know, one side would say, I support nuclear power, it's a great energy source, right? Somebody else would say, it's unsafe or it's corporate profit, you know. But now you've got a new element, someone saying no. The way we have to look at this is we don't have enough information and the people are hiding something. And that's, that's just another way of looking at this issue. It's a political way of looking at this issue. It's not a neutral way. It's, it's saying there's a, a different way we should look at this issue. Okay, Daniel Benamy. Yeah, it, it seems to me that what is new about this discussion is the stigmatization of interests. In other words, it's somehow considered a bad thing to have interests and to want to pursue those interests and to uh, create a better life for yourself as a result of pursuing those interests. We're all supposed to be these saint-like figures. And I think this assumption that we're all purely altruistic is a real problem because the stuff of politics really is about a clash of interests and about ideas and visions based on those interests. People uh, here seem to have a short political memory. I mean, in the case of British politics, the Labour Party was traditionally the party of organised labour, the clue is in the name of the party, and the Conservative Party was essentially the party of big business. So it, was, it had a particular kind of institutional form in Britain, and I'm not suggesting we go back to that old kind of form, but I think without people being open about interests, about pursuing interests, about wanting to uh, further those interests, there is no politics. It's not a question of making politics transparent. Without us being open about interests, there is no politics, there is no democracy. There might be the shell of politics and democracy, but it doesn't exist in reality. It seems to me that this is becoming the sort of standard British debate, which is to get all envious and upset about the stuff that's working and not focus on the stuff that isn't working. I'm not remotely as concerned about companies successfully lobbying Parliament as to the nature of le legislation as I am about the fact that Parliament isn't being adequately consulted as to what the people really want in their, those areas that are not um, being lobbied about. As a lawyer, I'd observe that when corporate interests are at, state, at stake, the technical quality of the legislation is likely to end up to be very much better um, after the lobbyists and their lawyers have been involved in helping those idiots in Parliament who don't understand anything about the law um, to draft it properly. When it's left to them and the parliamentary draftsmen, then they do an appalling job. And what we really should be worrying about is the fact that they're not being lobbied more widely. In my lifetime, I've seen two enormous organizations in this country, which were huge membership organizations and very influential, the two main political parties, collapse until they're now smaller than a fishing club. And what's really a scandal is that those were very largely the ways in which the people lobbied and they've died and nobody's noticed and nobody seems to care about it. And that's what's making parliamentarians more vulnerable the fact that they don't have constituents actively lobbying them day by day about real political issues. What got me involved in British politics again was the extremely poor quality and the disastrous nature of the Prevention of Terrorism Act, in which Britain effectively repealed what I would argue was its single greatest invention, habeas corpus. And I know that they were lobbied about that because I checked on what the Bar Council submitted um, to Parliament, I checked on what the Law Society submitted to Parliament, and there was very cogent and persuasive stuff, but there were no business interests involved. Um, it was just a discussion about what the law should be, and probably the most, I hope, the most appalling law of my lifetime was passed. So I don't think the problem is that in certain specific restricted areas where there are business interests at stake, that they are lobbying effectively and getting legislation of a better quality, the problem is the quality of all the other legislation where the public are not being involved. And I know I'm talking a lot, but one last point. I did take part in a public consultation recently on a proposal to extend the powers of the Court of Protection. Again, no business interests at stake there. This is just about protecting our grannies and grandfathers when they can't make decisions for themselves. There's an appalling extension to the powers being proposed, which will go beyond um, allowing them to deal with people who are not capable of making decisions for themselves and will extend it to people who do have full legal mental capacity. Now that has not made it and there's been no publicity about it, there's no business interests at stake, so nobody's lobbying the press to talk about it. And the consultation document was a sham. 
I went through it patiently and tried to answer the questions as constructively as I could, but the answers were already in the questions. By the time I, as a member of the public, was being asked, the bloody government had already decided. Hello. Um, there's something quite disingenuous about the point about corruption and stigmatisation of um, desire. Because no one is saying that government shouldn't consult business or industry. But there's a serious problem when the ability of government to go after wrongdoers is impeded by lobbying firms. So, for example, in America, where the debate about gun control is skewered because of huge lobbying interests. So you could talk about how corruption is a crime. Yes, it is. But the government isn't able to go after corruption because it has vested interests. So on one hand, yes, industry and business must be cons consulted. But on the other hand, government must never feel shackled when it has to do its proper job, which is to um, execute the law. Thank you very much. Um, there does seem to be a consensus that there is a vacuum, um, maybe not on uh, lobbying, but there does seem to be a consensus that there is a vacuum in um, politics at the top, be it from lack of trust or from lack of integrity or lack of ideology, lack of leadership. So irrespective, there has been this gap created and that's probably one of the reasons why lobbying has become so uh, big an industry, for better or for worse. But I've got one question, which is, do the panel believe, in the light of this increase in the lobbying industry, that um, civil servants and politicians are influenced in their decision-making with the possibility of what work they might get in future in mind? Just a very quick comment, but the fundamental idea of democracy is its egalitarian nature, that everyone has equal access to government and power. I don't understand how you can run a lobbying firm or be a lobbyist and believe in democracy in that sense. You charge a huge amount of money for your services. You know that access to the politicians that you provide is not equal. It's undemocratic. It doesn't seem that you believe in the system that you proudly say, well, lobbying's always been around. As a subverting process, it's not in any, any sense egalitarian. You ought to admit that. First of all, I just say I, I have a lot of criticism of the political class, right, as a whole, right, not one party or the other. I think, generally speaking, they've failed to come up with an answer to the crisis we're in right now. I've got a lot of criticisms, but I don't criticize, I don't think that they're robots who would just follow whoever, there's more lobbyists from one side, they're just going to follow that view, nor do I think that they're, you know, uh, crooks, essentially. It's just far too simplistic view of, of how politics works. Also, you know, I, I, I'm interested in having, in talking about politics and change. I don't think that those voices need to take expression through lobby, lobbyists. In fact, you know, collective change can happen in lots of ways and um, doesn't need to be specialized in that way. I thought it was a great thing that uh, it, it, all the, I have criticism of President Obama. I think it was a great thing that people rose up and voted for him and, and, and you know, lots of small donations and really showed if people collectively want to do something, they can override any big business or other considerations. Um, so I, I don't think it should be th th necessarily through lobbying. And, and I'm interested in kind of talking about the big issues that are on the table right now, right? Like the economic crisis, how are we going to get out of this? I don't think lobbying and influence had anything to do with causing this problem we're in. I don't think it's preventing us to having a solution to it either. So I think it's distorting the way getting to a real answer to what to do. Um, I was very interested to hear the gentleman who talked about um, th that you shouldn't actually be um, making, pursuing your public interest, your per personal interest be a bad thing, you know, we're stigmatizing them. It reminded me of my father, I mean, my father, bless him, lived till he was about 96, so saw a lot of political change in that time. Um, and I remember him saying to me, I was quite a small child actually, uh, growing up, starting to get interested in this stuff, and him saying to me, it's all very well to think about what's best for other people, but in a perfect democracy, if everybody voted for their own interests, it would work really well. Um, now, okay, that might be an idealized uh, situation, but it just reminded me of that. And I think I'd just come back, connected to that, this point about, you know, how can somebody from a lobbyist feel that's part of democracy? And, you know, are we talking about paid lobbyists? Are we talking about people who influence? You know, let's just take it in its broadest sense, somebody who is in a position of influence. And I come back to what I said, I think, earlier, which is, yes, of course, I think what you're talking about here is access and fair access. And I think there is a real point there. I don't happen to think that people who are in a position of influence 
um, should think that's not a really important part of democracy. The point for me is, is there still a gap? So that our decision makers need to be, I come back to the same point, there needs to be accountability to have said, who have I consulted with and am I consulting with everyone else should be? And if some of those people don't have access, how do I go and create that access? I mean, I, I certainly uh, would agree with you totally. Uh, there's nothing bad about, about having an interest, and indeed that's how politics works. Uh, when I was uh, just getting political in my 20s, I had an idealistic view that why, do, why doesn't everybody just work in the common good? Why isn't everybody working fair? And I've moved on from that view, I think, um, to, to understanding that actually we all have an interest in it and we can't understand everybody else's interests perfectly, so we need to kind of have a way of... of of, of hearing them all and having a way of bashing them out and some people will win in some issues and some in the other. The question is the extent to which power and influence skews the debate and it seems to me that we can argue about that till the cows come home. The perception is out there that power and money skew the debate and I, and I think there are lots of examples of where that is making it very difficult to make, for government to make decisions that actually don't really operate even in the interests of, of those trying to lobby on, them, on it. So the issue is partly about transparency because the world is not a perfect place and we do need to, make, we do need to bring some of these things out, of the, um, out into the open. But actually, much more of a question is how do we orientate government from looking inwards to looking outwards and asking you, all of us, about the, the issues that affect us so that we are more involved in the decisions it takes and stop involving us at the end of the process in small tick box consultations and start asking us about the big strategic questions. We've got an aging population, we've got to pay for pensions, we can't deal with the energy system. What do we want our country to look like in 50 years time? Why is nobody asking me that question? I want to be asked that question and have a proper debate about it and want to hear from everybody in the country. I don't want it just to happen behind closed doors because I want my voice to be heard as well. And those kinds of um, ideological debates are just not being had and that's the context I think that we should be um, thinking about. Uh, lobbying. Yeah, I agree with everything, absolutely everything that Simon and Mary just said, actually. Um, uh, I've just got three additional points to, to, to points that have been raised from the audience, two of which are general, one of which is sort of more personal. I think to your point just, just now about uh, the undemocratic, undemocratic nature of lobbying, and, and I think you made a point that we're making millions of pounds of money out of it. I think you may have missed the point I made earlier, which is that, from a personal perspective, my main role now is advising individuals or companies on how they should operate, not how I will operate with politicians. And we do a lot of pro bono work for charities. So, you know, and I don't think our agency is necessarily rare in that. There are other agencies who do that. So, yes, there is money in this industry. But there's also a lot of, of, of work that is done for free outside of or inside of that agency for charities and other organizations. Second point is more general, which I think is to a point raised back there, which I absolutely agree with. I've, I'm 33, I've, I've followed politics since I was about 16. I've seen you know, the major government, the end of the Thatcher government, the Blair government. We are now in a quite depressing state in this country of the, of the, of the quality of politicians that we have. Um, and that is potentially you know, an, a, 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 a reason why we have a, a growing industry because politicians themselves have become career politicians. They don't come from industry, they come from political backgrounds. I will never, I would never want to be a politician because I think it's hypocritical for someone like me who's lived and breathed this, this, this arena to then go into politics and unfortunately lots of our politicians are people like me who've done PR. The, the, the final point is, is around the drafting and, and which is going I think to your point Simon that we, and yours Mary, that we, um, we're starting off our policy making process in this country in the, in the, in the wrong form and I see so many examples of really poorly drafted legislation by government, which has supposedly gone through a year of, of white paper, green paper, and it's just appalling. And it takes lobbyists and corporate entities and charities who are experts in that field to talk to government and say, you've got that absolutely bloody wrong. And then actually the best part of our democratic process is when, is when bills get to the Lords because the Lords, fortunately, for the time being at least, is not full of elected politicians. It's full of people, generally speaking, who have had a career outside of politics and who know what they're talking about. Please thank our speakers.